Well, Netflix saw a second straight quarter of subscription declines, losing nearly a million paid subscribers, but that was fewer than expected. But the pressure is mounting for the streaming giant now working to now working to boost growth again by adding advertising. There's lots of moving parts to the Netflix story. Let's uh, ne speak now to Bruce Croxon. He's a co-founder of Round 13 Capital, an expert in the tech sector and a sometime critic of Netflix. Bruce, great to have you with us. What do you make of this, uh, uh, where we are now in uh, Netflix uh, subscriber growth or decline cycle? The company has lost substantial amounts of subscribers over the that last couple of quarters. It came, first of all, as a shock to the market. We saw the stock collapse. We're now seeing, uh, in the way the stock market works, the stock actually rally after Netflix loses nearly a million subscribers. Why? Because it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Yes, and, and, and good point on the sell-off, mentioning the sell-off as a backdrop to the story, because after you've sold off 70%, and you have you know 200 million subscribers on a business, there still is hope for this company, and there still are investors willing to bet that you know 70% is a massive sell-off uh, for somebody with that kind of subscriber loyalty. So let's put it into perspective: a million lost subscribers, two million lost subscribers uh, off a base of 200 million isn't catastrophic. My fundamental uh, position on this company hasn't changed. You know, if, you have to separate the income statement on these companies from the balance sheet. So wh while they may have a strong quarter or two in terms of generating profit on an income basis, which basically means the revenue prescriber is greater than the operating costs of running that business, even though it's a surprisingly low margin business, uh, that drives a certain bottom line. My issue with the company, Paul, as you know, is that bottom line in any quarter, certainly in any year, has not come close to covering the, the very thirsty beast, which is content production. The, the money that has to be spent on the balance sheet that ends up as depreciable assets on the income statement, um, the amount of money that has to be invested to keep that funnel full is astronomical, and, and it isn't going down anytime soon. So. There's only so many ways to skin this cat if you're Netflix, right? You have to grow subscribers. You have to uh, make more money per, prescribe, per, per subscriber. Or you have to reduce the cost of content production. The third thing isn't going to happen. There's too much competition in the market. So that leaves two things, subscriber growth and also getting more revenue prescriber. The company has plans to try and address the latter. As you can tell by this latest report, the number of absolute subscribers is very much in flux. The, the company is seriously considering, and I think it acknowledges this, moving uh, to, uh, to one option that would allow uh, subscribers to pay a lower monthly fee, but they would have to put up with commercials during uh, their programming. Uh, is that kind of option going to fly these days? Yeah, I think so. And I, and I think they, they're right to be exploring every possible option. So for clarity, you know, I put that into the more more revenue per subscriber bucket, whether it's ads that you can attribute across the number of subscribers or increase in, in monthly fees or any other way that you can take advantage of the uh, loyalty of the subscribers you do have to get a little bit more share of wallet falls into the bucket of, of, of more revenue per, per subscriber. And the main reason that we were willing to support the stock and give it such a high valuation, uh, like we were a lot of other technology plays, frankly, at the time, was that it was along the narrative of, of look, you know, we're growing subscribers. We're not killing it, but we're growing subscribers. They're loyal. And trust us, we'll figure out a way to extract more value from them over time. And as long as you have that belief in a market where that's a bull market with a lot of money on the sidelines willing to support the story, that's what led to the massive runoff on this and a lot of other tech stocks, frankly. Now, that whole narrative, as you know, has come home to roost. People are more focused on, will this thing ever actually generate cash? Not a profit on the income statement, but actual cash, or is it gonna be a perpetual 
money-sucking machine. Does Disney and its uh, streaming service face the same fundamental challenge here of uh, con continuing to have to spend outsized amounts of money on, on content? Uh, for, for what it's worth, and it's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, Disney stock has also been cut in half over the past year. Now, Disney is yeah. not a pure play streaming service. There are many other uh, pieces of the Disney business, as, as people know very yes. well. Uh, but uh, d does Disney, a part of the Disney content franchises, the enormously popular Marvel comic book uh, movies and the Star Wars uh, movies, does it need to continue feeding the beast in the same way that Netflix does? So yes and no. I mean, the, the beast needs to continue to be fed. It's just a question of whether or not you already own the content right. that you're feeding it with or you have to actually go out and continually spend to create new content. Disney's advantage is, of course, as you just pointed out, they've got a library. So you hear Netflix talking about franchise creation, hoping that if they put $200 million into a series like they are with the gray man or the yellow man or can't remember what man, color man, that is their latest launch and their latest hope. But they obviously are hoping that that leads to sequels and spinoffs and value outside of the just, you know, one and done viewership that will prop up subscribers in the short term, but isn't really gonna add to the franchise value.